So we figured seeing this is the day that Mitsuharu Masawa tragically died inside the ring due to, I believe, a dangerous backdrop suplex by Akitoshi Saito that we, the fans, would pay tribute to one of, if not the greatest, the most influential wrestlers to have ever lived. Without further ado, let's, uh, let's do this. So Mitsuharu Mizawa, where to even begin? Like, ultra-tier wrestler. Well, I suppose right at the start, right? Yeah, born June 18, 1962. Hailing from Yubari, Hokkaido, Japan, Masao was trained by Dory Funk Jr., Jumbo Tsuruda, Dick Bayer, and uh, the big man himself, Giant Baba. So say what you will about Baba, but at least he filled up arenas. That is very true, he did. He began wrestling in 1981. He had a debut match for All Japan Pro Wrestling against veteran Shiro Koshinaka on August 21st, and was surprisingly quite good, which you wouldn't have guessed initially. Seeing he is wearing what every other wrestler from Japan would wear. Red trunks, red boots, and I'm sorry, but if it wasn't red, guess what the next best color would be? Black. And fuck me, everyone was wearing black, which makes it quite difficult to know who is who when you got the same haircut, same trunks, same boots, and you don't know what the hell the announcers are saying. Anyway, wrestling for All Japan Pro Wrestling, Masawa wasn't all that big of a deal until three years would pass, and upon his return from a short tour to Mexico for EMLL, wrestling as Kamikaze Masawa, and gained a bit of a high-flying skills from the man who created the frog splash, La Fiera, the original Tiger Mask, you know, uh, the high-flying first variant, is that Saturo Sayama, who had famous bouts with Dynamite Kid, well, he stepped down, and it was decided by Giant Baba that Masawa would undergo the Tiger Mask gimmick, becoming the second variation, which was vastly different from Saturo Sayama's version. He kept the mask on up to 1990, I believe winning the PWF Tag Championship on July 3rd, defeating Stan Hansen and Ted DiBiase, winning the All-Asia Tag Team title with partner Kenta Kobashi, defeating the fantastic team of the Can-Am Express on April 9 of 1990. We would also take part in 1990's WWF, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and All Japan Pro Wrestling Joint Wrestling Summit in a time limit draw against Bret Hart. This pay-per-view would start off the All Japan, New Japan War, which would last about 9 to 10 years. Anyway, one month later, he had a tag match during May's Super Power Series, tagging with Kawada and defeating Samson Fuyuki and Yoshiaki Yatsu. Now this match had one notable thing in it, didn't it Trent? That's right, 1990 is ultimately the year for Mizawa's tremendous momentum soaring through the skies. The push he had was like no other, and my god, we can just have a montage of the bumps this guy takes. Pure no insanity. Kidding. Insane to insane on the head, neck, upper shoulders, folding like an accordion, giving the handrail kisses, flopping onto the outside, the pure madness of this man. And it's crazy that uh, these guys were taking bumps like this, like, back in the late 70s, early 80s, you didn't see this kind of bumps in, like, North American wrestling, this is strictly in Japan. Literally, like, just the fact that they're just, like, taking these crazy, crazy bumps onto, like, the neck and all that, it just shows, like... The amount of like effort they put into like stressing on like neck workouts and like the bridge workouts for better. absolutely, and these weren't for like pay per views. These were just for like TV tapings, house shows. Like they didn't need to go the distance for these, but it just showed you a different culture of wrestling uh, in Japan compared to North American wrestling. Here. Completely, it's it's like a martial art over there. Basically, that's how I look. That's how I've always like always looked at it. It's like they treat it like another form of a martial art over there. It's not like pro wrestling as like an entertainment it pro wrestling as another style of yep. martial arts through yep. discipline <laughs> yes pro wrestling in fact is very strong it's also like strong style basically the whole concept of like you can use pro wrestling as a martial art that is your martial art to win in a fight instead of having to like oh i'm a pro wrestler but i also do martial arts no you're a pro wrestler and that's your martial art and the matches he has against the top gaijins at this time i'm sorry but they're some of the greatest spectacles of all time you do not want to see this man go up against his native countrymen. Well, I mean, other than Kabashi, Kawada, Tawe, so on. But the Stan Hansen matches are absolutely brutal to watch. Likewise, the Terry Gordy matches, the Dr. Death Steve William matches, the Vader matches, basically all the big gaijins. Anyway, fast forward a decade, and Giant Baba is dead. And guess who Makoto Baba decides to appoint as the president of All Japan Pro Wrestling? None other than Misawa himself. Just take it and run with this ball, young man. But Baba's widow, Motoko Baba, butted heads with Misawa often, 
due to awful booking decisions by Makoto. He was removed from the board and Makoto thought he would remain and stay one of the top talents, but he surprised everyone, said fuck it, and informed Pro Wrestling Noah and uh, and basically like I think 23 of the wrestlers uh, from All Japan Pro Wrestling basically followed suit with him. So that was ultimately like the death of All Japan Pretty Pro Wrestling. Pretty much. Pretty much. The only, like, there was only, like, two major that stayed back, and the one that was, like, notable was Kawada. Wasn't it Kawada and Kaiji Muto, I believe? Yes. Let's quickly go over his accolades before we move on here. At this point, Mizawa had won the NWA International Junior Heavyweight Championship, the PWF Tag Team Championship, the All Asia Tag Team Championship twice, the All Japan Pro Wrestling Tag Team Championship six times, and he was a Triple Crown Champion five times so that is an insane push for like 1990s wrestling they could have picked literally anyone to do this but they basically appointed everything and uh, uh to misawa and basically told him to run with a ball and that's exactly what he did literally, literally he, he there's no other way to put it but like just like he was like the unbeatable superstar there's no other way to put it like i don't like using this reference but i want to say he was like the hogan of Japan, but I don't want to like. Him. It's just it's the connotations with Hulk Hogan itself because of who he is. But he was that guy, like he was their yeah. ace, like he was the ace. Like when you think of like '90s Japan wrestling, you think of him, like for the most part. Like he was the top guy, the guy, the unbeatable guy. If you beat him, it was a big deal. Like, yeah. There's just something about like the aura about Mizawa, not even just like presentation and whatnot but just his aura just how he like when he came out and like the crowd chanting and just him getting in the ring and just him going against everybody like literally anybody who came up against him and he beat everyone it was just like Masawa um, can end a match in any which way so back on track the Masawa all japan pro wrestling alliance he basically told all his mates in all japan hey i'm leaving and i'm gonna make my own organization if you'd like you can come which was ultimately the end of all japan at the time he went on to create Pro Wrestling Noah, and it was a massive landslide of talent that followed him. He would go on to have more fantastic, hard-hitting matches in the 2000s. And let's be honest, how can you not when 23 natives of the previous organization is following you to your ship, and you got big American names popping in for a visit frequently, right? Yep. Literally, like, he was, like, bringing everybody into Noah, and he was also traveling abroad, too, to, like... Well, one, he only traveled abroad once, correct? Like to Ring of Honor. Yeah, I, I think he did a Ring of Honor show in the States, and uh, the second Ring of Honor show that I'm aware they was in, I believe, happened in Japan. And he like they completely like brought in a different style. Like when it came, like the whole concept of him wanting to leave was to modernize the style, like of the booking, basically. When he left all Japan, and that's what it basically became in Noah. But for better or for worse, in the end, unfortunately, because of like him feeling like he needed to be like the top guy and always like the main draw to like keep people coming back for better or for worse and to keep the TV ratings going too as well despite the fact that he was getting on years in the fight despite the fact that like the injuries he was accumulated and just keep going oh, yeah. and just going and going because they needed him because Kobashi was really really injured and he had cancer at one point too so he was yeah, gone. that's insane like just reading about all this is just like like going back and doing all this research for this was just like how like how do you just bounce back yeah. from that and then just go oh yeah i'm just gonna come back and have some like wild matches for another like 10 years i'll tell you how strong spirit style literally <laughs> <laughs> and this brings us sadly to his final match misawa and his protege go shiozaki challenged the ghc tag champs aikitoshi saito and bison smith this match took place on june 13 2009 on a tv taping of pro wrestling noah Masao was taking the same dangerous move he has taken literally thousands of times. Like, the backdrop suplex there is like the vertical suplex of America. Pretty much. You know, like, the, that that is the vertical suplex out there. People pop for that. <laughs> but yeah, Masao was taking the same dangerous bump, except this time, sadly, he suffered atlantoaxial dislocation, which for us plebs is simplified means his neck snapped upon impact. But we don't want to send you all packing on a sad note. Rest in peace, Mitsuharu Misawa.